Okay, I'm going to do a quick recording here for uh, just a demonstration of um, some of the ideas and um, parts I was working with with the mendicant painting. <laughs> Sorry about the delay between mendicant and painting. I'm not a professional presenter, so sorry about that. So, first couple of things when I set about drawing um, an image like that, uh, starting in paint or whatever I happen to be using, I'll usually set out some um, uh, curves and line work, basically stick figures, to try to get some ideas of um, form and intention. So like in this case, it looks something like this. It's usually anatomically based, so I'll be, I set the angles of the um, uh, bones in. Um, just because it's a precursor for where I'll be setting muscle. be talking too much through this um, at points where I think there might be kind of an unusual method I'm using or um, something worth emphasizing I'll, I'll pipe up but on the whole I'll, I'll be fairly quiet The, this image won't be exactly the same, um, just as the way I think through and work through it. Actually, an angle, a change in, a slight change in angle can come out with um, uh, some unexpected and even um, theme-altering results. So, maybe some... real variation in uh, feel for this sketch against the the painting as it's been progressing.
small hand. Um, you may notice on occasion that um, my hand will fake out a line. I'll actually not fulfill a, um, a line, but I'll uh, seem to be tracing over something. Um, that's usually just um, my hand mapping anatomy that doesn't need to be presented. So I, I still go through the motions literally often, um, and it just helps maintain uh, uh, continuity for me. It's not something that anyone else really has to do. <laughs> but you have to do all the rest of what I'm showing. That's not true. I made that up. You don't actually have to do what I'm showing. Okay, so at this part, it might be important to point out a couple of things here before I get into the angle of the hand. Um, when I go into this, um, and it's actually not the hand I'm working on right now, I'm, I'm just filling in details while I'm talking and kind of letting my brain go on automatic and make minor corrections here and there. Um, a main focus for the hand right, you know, in this area is the difference between what a hand would actually angle like, which um, isn't necessarily uh, graceful or pretty, or if it is graceful and pretty, you might want to distort that also. And the, the uh, range between the two ideas that I'll usually find I'm going through is the difference between the way a hand feels when you open it out for example, in this case, um, he's he's begging, um, opening it out. Am I going to actually have the angle of a hand opened out as it looks or the angle of a hand opened out as it feels? So am I going to be trying to trigger someone's um, somatosensory system to give over a lot of support as to what I'm what the curves, lines, and corners I'm drawing here present? Or am I going to give a fairly accurate presentation so that when, when your brain is processing this human-like image and is trying it on or projecting your, um, your bodily agency into it, um, will it read properly and try to figure out the intentions of this figure? So um, there, there are two different things. One can be... Um, uh, beautifully posed, but if you were to actually beg like that, money would fall through your hand, let's say. Um, but the other would be um, accurate and showing that um, uh, um, basically giving a, a natural feel to what he's doing. So in this one, I unlike the other one, the other one I have the hand palm open as if the hand has a personality and is facing front. This one I'm going to have a little more relaxed and angled over instead of um, face flat. This guy is going to be a little bit angled in. You know, just to, this is kind of what's playing in my mind as I'm doing this. Um, this will alter the character of things quite a bit to just change the angle um, 
not what I wanted for the first picture, so I, I did it differently. Um, little different balances in this. And as I say, these uh, slight shifts in balance can tell very different dramatic stories um, or give different reads as to where your sympathies lie or, or your, how to trigger your standard model of reality to uh, bring all the baggage of your sentiment in and project it onto this or that character. Um, this is a lot of, of what I'm considering when I'm, I'm drawing these things. It isn't so much whether or not I'm getting the anatomy right or whether or not I, I have my values correct. Those are important things too because you, you want things to read accurately. But um, being that this is for human beings, to human beings, it's important to try to understand what it is they're going to be bringing into the, the image. It has to be remembered that... Um, when people see things, they aren't seeing things as if the the visual the the photons are just dropping into their eyes and are a one for one. Um, people are operating through a standard model of reality, which is um, how their brain has patterned their experience thus far. Um, that will override by like a huge percentage um, the uh, the amount of new data coming in. So when you see anything new, you're going to, your cognitive biases will be coloring it, changing it, making it other likenesses than what's actually painted or drawn. And that can take years to get past. So in each painting, drawing, or any piece of artwork, there should be an, imb an embedded sense or an embedded knowledge that your audience is not going to see what you're doing for a very long time, that it's going to take them a great deal of um, experience and events and familiarity with your work, with the, each individual piece and what that piece is showing before they actually start to see a number of the details or, or um, aspects of the work that you're going to be presenting. Um, it's a, a pretty important thing as an artist to understand that and to put the clues in, being that they're not going to see 90% of your picture, to put the clues in for the audience years down the road, you know, for, for later when they're able to start discerning it. Um, have enough information, that, enough information that the painting will be a new painting for them every time they see it. Um, it that that may be a little abstract and that that has some um, tactics and techniques and uh, it, it helps to see charts on how people actually see in their their eye movements and um, some familiarity with attentional blindness which is how people see but what they don't see even though their eyes land on it um, there's an attentional aware awareness test on YouTube that is fantastic and and should anyone want to look it up we'll give them a fine and shocking example of how little you actually see um but an artist should be aware of that and we're we should make and compensate for the whole world that the audience is going to be looking at um i'm doing this on a slightly gray background so i'll, I'll just show a quick thing of uh, how i'm going how i would normally start to deal with light um, uh, basically taking the passive highlight and giving a hint as to where it'll be dropping in um, basically the, the passive highlight is quick review is the um, point of uh, most absorption of light on a surface, usually closest to um, uh, perpendicular to the casting light on a surface. And that should give the idea somewhat. Obviously this is a quick sketch. Um, 
um, if you notice a number of just angles or directions I'm putting in will um, give over a great deal of information. Um, I'm not especially of the belief that you shouldn't overdraw a picture. I've heard that term um, because it is real that um, audiences will um, fill in the blanks if you don't have to put in every part of a picture and the audience will understand it. But I do like to fill it out as thoroughly as possible because um, what they aren't picking up now, they'll pick up later. The more familiar the picture becomes, the more familiar the incomplete and sketchy areas will be. So as far as possible, I think it's a good idea to turn over the, the most thorough vision that you can. Um, we're kind of world building when we're doing this. There's implicit histories in, in every figure, like we can give this, this figure a general age and maybe even a time period and, and so on and so forth, depending on what type of details I put in. So um, I, where it's easy to turn over to the audience their um, ability to uh, build simulacra and pareidolia, their, their brain's ability to uh, enact pattern recognition. I find it helpful to give it as many assists and as much direction and emphasis as possible so that um, whatever the story I'm telling can be thoroughly understood, or if it's not a story but just an experience, that the full range of the experience um, can be apprehended with as little effort to the audience as possible. Um, yeah, so I probably don't need to say much more on that. Okay, let's see. That's what I was hoping to see. Um, just adding in some cast shadow. Now, with this, with the mendicant painting, um, I did want emphatic light. I'll, uh, I'm, I obviously don't do layers like this with... Um, uh, with a painting and he's not quite as out of proportion in a painting either although I will make him out of proportion um, I wanted some real type of lighting in other words I wanted the hand emphasized but I also didn't want um, to have you know one light here that's bouncing and directed there and then give 50 other artificial but interesting bouncing lights I think one of the things that um, uh, makes for an interesting picture is a certain amount of blandness or uninteresting detail that can be secondary and creep in. So where there's a strong light, I put in a more diffuse light as if they're both sharing the same source but maybe coming through cloth. Um, so from about here you'll be getting the most direct unimpeded light and on him it will be a more diffuse um, dispersed light uh, still bright still at times um, uh, exposed but um, not not as powerful a little more um, dampening of uh, chroma a little less uh, a little closer toward the gray in the color scale you know so um, that was a consideration too, basically um, setting up a priority of light priority one here, light priority two here, and then secondary lights like bounce lights from the wall or bounce lights from the ground, um, the doorway in the background um, diffusing a lot of the darks and uh, creating some glare. Um, those types of lights adding adding more for use in understanding depth. So they aren't necessarily um, uh, characters in themselves. They are helping to set a scene, their context, and um, trying to cue uh, a viewer to the discomforts of looking at a thing. So for example, glare, your inability to see what's going on in here. Um, cloth and rags, uh, indicators of some of the things that uh, is diffu are diffusing the light that's, that he's uh, standing in the shadows. So those were some of the considerations is um, 
and let me explain what I mean by light as a character. Um, light can have a certain, um, you can treat it as if it has a, a heroism, a, a certain character, but you can also have it um, uh, trigger tactile or um, feeling cues, like um, uh, hot and cold, um, like your, uh, your eyes are watering. You can, give, you can give over these signals without the light necessarily being a directional, um, pointed, theatrical um, object. You can actually have those as environmental cues as opposed to um, uh, points of emphasis or, or even like on his hand where the light is kind of a character in, in itself. So, um, yeah, those are some of the considerations I go over when I'm doing one of these images. Um, I hope that was helpful and not convoluted. Uh, so, um, thanks a lot.